anyhow, please, uh, John, I won't, I won't introduce you properly. Just say you've written some wonderful articles, a great book, and, and you want to tell us now about the command of Mardonius and that you come from Christopher Newport University in Virginia. That's a very succinct, I'm sorry, but please, we want to hear you. <laughs> Thank you uh, so much, Meg, uh, and uh, thank you to Natasha for organizing this and, and for uh, giving the opportunity to have a dialogue between Persians and Thebans and Spartans and, and others um, on this occasion. Um, I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Bear with me for a minute, and uh, hopefully this will work well. Uh, okay, uh, can everyone see this and hear me? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Uh, then, let's see, then uh, I will proceed. Mardonius, the son of Gobrius, is among Herodotus' most sinister characters, whose flattery and deception pushes Xerxes into the fateful decision to march upon Greece, and whose death at Plataea provides a satisfying recompense for the tragedy he had set in motion. My paper seeks to contextualize the literary figure by considering the early Achaemenid political backdrop for Mardonius's activities and exploring the familial and court dynamics that may have influenced his preferment for military command in 479. I will argue that his responsibility for the launching of the Greek campaign was inflated due to the disastrous outcome at Plataea, despite a recent study's expression of doubt on the tradition of Mardonius's battlefield death. The Persian general's disaster served to redirect attention away from the naval defeat that had occurred in the royal presence. And the Herodotian portrayal of Mardonius reflects the influence of this strand of politicized oral tradition. Okay. Mardonius's elite standing and prosopographic connections with the Achaemenid royal family are documented in the Persepolis Fortification Archive as well as Herodotus. Rudiger Schmidt's articles in the Real Lexicon de Assyria Legi and the Encyclopedia Ironica, as well as Josef Wieserhofer's recent chapter, provide thorough summaries of this evidence. But it is possible to go somewhat further in considering the implications of, these, uh, of his familial inheritance and his royal marriage for Mardonius's evolving status in the court politics of Darius and Xerxes' reign. Mardonius succeeded his father in a close alliance with the Achaemenid family that predated Darius's seizure of power in 522. Despite being named for his paternal grandfather, as you can see from this family tree, Mardonius may have been born from Gobrius's second marriage. Gobrius married the daughter of his Taspes, who became Mardonius's mother. But Already in the same period, he seems to have had an adult daughter to bestow on his Taspi's young son, Darius, with whom she had at least three children during the reign of Cambyses. If Mardonius also had half-brothers from his father's earlier union, then he would have been elevated above them due to his mother's higher status and connection to the Achaemenids, which only increased in value when Darius took the throne. Like Xerxes in the famous succession inscription, XPF, Mardonius may have been able to boast that his father had other offspring, but chose to make him greatest after himself. Gobrius's legacy, based on connection to the crown, but also reflecting social power beyond the sphere of the court, was sufficient to establish Mardonius among the empire's principal nobles. While he would have inherited wealth and household personnel attached to multiple estates in Iran and perhaps other regions such as Babylonia, Mardonius is also likely to have acquired his father's leadership role within the semi-autonomous tribal community known as the Patishuvarish, uh, which entailed certain lands and resources that predated royal grants and stood outside the direct purview of the imperial administration. Mardonius's opportunities to earn prestige in his own right expanded with his marriage to Darius's daughter, whom Herodotus names Artazostre. This union, attested in March 498 in an issue of travel rations to the wife of Mardonius, daughter of the king, placed Mardonius in a very small and selective group of royal sons-in-law. At this date, the number of Darius's marriageable daughters would have still been relatively small, as only a quarter century had passed since the king's succession and post-succession marriages, 
several of which had produced multiple sons before or instead of daughters. A wedding to one of these princesses offered elevation over most of Mardonius's male peers and special opportunities for related advancement. Darius appears to have used his sons-in-law as favored proxies in the military operations of his later reign, uh, when he no longer traveled to the frontiers to command in person. Mardonius was one of four royal sons-in-law attested in charge of armies during the Persian response to the Ionian revolt and the follow-up operations across the northern Aegean. Through their commands, the king could project a continuing personal association with victories over distant rebels that displayed royal power, much as Augustus Caesar would later entrust his stepsons with missions of expansion in Germany beyond the Rhine. In this context, Mardonius's expedition in 492 was especially significant. It not only improved the political stability of the Ionian cities, but reestablished Persian authority over Thrace and Macedonia on the far side of the sea. Darius's own European expedition had initially established Persian power on the northern shores of the Aegean, exploiting the symbolic resonance of the sea as an outer boundary of the civilized world to be crossed by culture heroes such as Gilgamesh and Sargon of Akkad. Mardonius's campaign repeated and restored the effects of this royal accomplishment, even if it did entail a certain number of casualties and lost ships in the storm off Mount Athos. Herodotus portrays the campaign as a failure by insisting that its true targets were Eretria and Athens and claims that the outcome brought shame on the army, but multiple studies have regarded this charge as an exaggeration that denies the credit which Mardonius is likely to have earned at the time. This campaign may have enhanced his standing at court, creating a reputation for Aegean regional expertise that continued into Xerxes' reign. Any influence that Mardonius exerted over preliminary plans for the campaign of 480 would have drawn on his experience leading an expedition along the same initial route as Xerxes' forces. He was better suited than most to contribute to the logistical planning for military and naval movements along the Thracian coast and the project of digging a canal through the promontory where his ships had come to grief in 492. But this is not to say that historians should take Herodotus at face value when he claims Mardonius stood higher in Xerxes' favor than any other Persian and employed this unique relationship to pressure the monarch into launching the Greek campaign. Xerxes had many other cousins, and we should not assume that Darius's surviving sons-in-law automatically retained the same standing after a change of monarch, since the new king had not selected them himself. Mardonius must have done his utmost to cultivate Xerxes' attention, but could not necessarily count on the same degree of favor that Gobrias enjoyed in Darius's reign. He would have had to compete with other royal favorites, Artabazus, for instance, who supposedly quarreled with Mardonius before Plataea, is also credited by Herodotus as an aner dokimos, with few equals in the eyes of Xerxes. When Herodotus lists the principal generals placed in charge of the army, Mardonius is only one among six, including two other royal cousins and the king's full brother, and he does not command the picked regiments of so-called immortals. In this context, the accusation of Mardonius's secret desire to become the hyparch of Hellas is dubious at best. Apart from the counterfactual question of Persian administrative intentions if the invasion of Greece had succeeded, it is unclear why this ambition should have appealed to a man whose authority was rooted in competitive proximity to the king and to a secondary degree in the tribal leadership status among the Parishuvarish in Iran inherited from his father. There was a great difference between command of a finite frontier expedition ending in return to court and permanent assignment to a exceptionally distant frontier province. The evil advisor has a certain appeal as a stock folktale character, and Herodotus gives a great characterization of the manipulations Mardonius supposedly used to press Xerxes into war. In this literary construct, Mardonius is the only imperial noble who advocates for war, while the Persians as a collective whole remain silent out of fear until Artabanus speaks and then express their joy when Xerxes prematurely tries to cancel the expedition. This is surely oversimplification for literary effect, 
as there's no reason to accept the depiction of Persian elites as reluctant warriors, especially on the heels of Xerxes' victories over Egyptians and Babylonians in 485 to 484. Numerous other figures stood to benefit from a new royal expedition to the Northwest frontier. Potential candidates include regional figures such as the Satrap of Sardis or Hydarnes, a general in coastal Anatolia who sent Spartan ambassadors on to Xerxes before the campaign and may be the same man as the leader of the immortals in 480. Herodotus stresses the general of the immortals as commander of the flank march at Thermopylae uh, and notes his insistence on staying with Xerxes instead of remaining in Greece when the king returned to Sardis. It may not be a coincidence that this prominent noble is omitted from debates preceding the campaign, but named in connection with Persian victory and credited with special devotion to the monarch in contrast with Mardonius's self-serving ambition. Mardonius, for his part, is nowhere to be seen when the Persians are victorious, but serves as the campaign's initial instigator and resurfaces as cause of its final defeat. This selectivity need not be Herodotus's alone, but as several scholars, uh, including Christopher and Roll, uh, who are here with us, have surmised, it appears to evoke an Achaemenid tradition that associated the negative outcomes of the expedition with a fallen general instead of the king. Several passages in Herodotus highlight Mardonius's responsibility for the expedition's outcome. An early speech appears uh, in uh, the speech of Artabanus, who issues the Homeric toned prophecy that Mardonius's wish for command would end with his body left in Greece as prey for birds and dogs. After the pre-invasion council, Mardonius reappears as Xerxes spokesman in the gathering of client kings and captains before Salamis, strengthening his association with failure. Perceiving that Persians are blaming him for the naval disaster, he offers to take the fatal command in the vain hope of avoiding punishment and winning back his credit with Xerxes. And when Spartan envoys show up in camp just before Xerxes leaves, demanding justice for Leonidas, Xerxes sneers that they will get their justice from Mardonius, inadvertently prophesying the actual outcome. In portraying the scapegoat's fate, Herodotus's narrative arc seems to draw both on Greek and Persian oral traditions. Selections of individuals to absorb divine anger in place of the king are well attested among Persia's Near Eastern predecessors and continued in Achaemenid cultural parlance, whether or not the court ever practiced a full Assyrian style substitute king ritual, which culminated in the victim sacrifice. The negative tradition concerning Mardonius most likely took shape after Plataea, and we do not have to accept the charge that he was initially blamed for Salamis, which would make it more difficult to understand why Xerxes appointed him to the delegated command. There was plentiful precedent for the king turning over authority to a trusted general at the end of a campaign or shortly thereafter in response to further resistance by newly conquered subjects. In Herodotus, the classic cases are Harpagus in Ionia or Megabazus in Thrace after Darius's return from the Scythian campaign. The practice is also documented though, in the Bisatun inscription, which shows the assignment of several of Darius's lieutenants to suppress regions that had slipped back into rebellion after initial Persian victories. Among these was Mardonius's father, Gobrius, who crushed a renewed Elamite uprising in the year after Darius's forces had secured control of the Iranian heartland. Such royal subordinates' victories were credited to the greater glory of the king, enhancing the king's martial reputation. Mardonius may have come close to achieving such a favorable outcome through his diplomatic and military strategies in 479 until they came to sudden ruin on the field of Plataea. But as Herodotus's Artemisia recognizes, an unsuccessful deputy could be distanced from the monarch and credited with defeat in solitude. By blaming the general for a military failure, the king's agents could try to forestall any questions about the continuation of divine support for a ruler who had launched the initial campaign. Xerxes' Daiwa inscription connects his military success in smiting agents of discord with the ongoing grace of Ahura Mazda. But Mardonius' death and defeat could be used to indicate that the god's goodwill did not extend to this unworthy general. A recent study, however, has raised new concerns about Herodotus's veracity on Mardonius's fate. 
based on his possible mention in Babylonian documents that post-date Xerxes' invasion, discussed uh, by Christopher in his talk. Julian Dagan and Robert Rollinger have questioned whether the general might have lived to escape with an army that was not as thoroughly destroyed as the Greek tradition suggests. Their doubts are rooted uh, in these Babylonian contracts from the reign of Xerxes, associated with a uh, workshop of artisans supplying bricks on demand for wealthy customers. Three of these texts um, published by Matthew Stolper in 1992, uh, who's with us today among the uh, attendees, uh, and Michael Yursa uh, in 2015, document orders for tens of thousands of bricks by one uh, Kibi or Kibel, who was named as a household steward of Mardonius. Absentee landlordism is a well-known feature of the Achaemenid presence in Babylonia. Were it not for the dates, the tablets might warrant the assumption that the Mardonius in question is Xerxes' uh, famous general. But while British Museum 72139 uh, dates either to June 27th, 479, or July 16th, 478, uh, the other two texts uh, definitely date to the 478 to 477 regnal year, uh, that is year eight of Xerxes. Since the Battle of Plataea occurred in the summer of 479, this raises the problem of how to interpret household activities associated with Mardonius a year or longer after his supposed death. Matthew Stolper's original article called attention to this issue and suggested two solutions. Either the texts refer to a homonymous but unrelated Mardonius, or they involve the household of the famous Mardonius as, quote, a posthumous mention of a man whose prerogatives and property had not been reassigned or whose agent had not yet found a new affiliation. Dagan's and Rollinger's alternative hypothesis proposes that if the estate did belong to the well-known general, its operation so long after Plataea would imply that his battlefield death was, quote, fictitious. If correct, this would radically undermine our trust in the basic events of the Herodotian war narrative and the feasibility of historical reconstruction of Persian Greek conflicts. But the supposed Greek invention of Mardonius's death would require a thorough explanation of how such a phenomenon could have come to pass. How then should we explain the detailed traditions involving the identification of his killer or the rewards that his son Artantes supposedly bestowed on multiple individuals who claimed involvement in his clandestine burial? How did no rumor of Mardonius's survival reach Herodotus or his informants in an Aegean Greek world that was never hermetically sealed from the Achaemenid provinces? Denial of Mardonius's death, in short, raises numerous additional problems for historic interpretation. Uh, and so, in my opinion, does not justify preference over Stolper's proposed explanations of the Babylonian documents. In fact, there may be at least one parallel in the Persepolis fortification archive, um, as well as uh, the Arshama archive text that Christopher has mentioned, or a noble household's posthumous description under its late owner's name. Although the tablets, few explicit references to deaths of administrators do not shed light on the procedures regarding disposal of their personal resources. The man in question is his Taspes, the father of Darius, who is last attested in texts from the year 501 to 500 and seems to have passed away by some time in the year 500 to 499. Vauder Henkelmann has proposed a connection between his Taspes burial at Persepolis and his daughter's journey from Media to Persepolis without him in travel texts from 500 to 499. But it was not until the following regnal year that his Taspes personal staff, still labeled as household men of his Taspes in PF 1596, uh, traveled through Farce in July to August of 499. Henkelmann has associated their journey with preparations for dispersal and reallocation to new masters within the imperial system. The survey and assessment of dispersed family assets upon the death of royal family members, uh, and especially a tribal aristocrat whose holdings extended beyond those directly granted by the crown, is likely to have been a slow and laborious process, even in more peaceful circumstances. The campaign-related absence of the king and those administrators traveling with his court 
would only have exacerbated delays. If Xerxes did not leave Sardis until sometime after Plataea and Mycale, he could not have returned to the empire's Iranian centers until December 479 at the very earliest, not counting detours or pauses en route for conspicuous consumption and displays of campaign spoils. Before he turned his attention to the disposal of resources belonging to the dead, estate agents tasked with the management of individual properties could hardly do other than cultivate household assets, identifying themselves by their old master's label while waiting for a royal decision that might decide their future. With this in mind, it does not appear necessary to discard the death of Mardonius at Plataea, but the Babylonian texts prompt welcome reflection on the social impact of military setbacks beyond Persia's frontiers. They remind us that the losses suffered in Xerxes and Mardonius's campaigns, while hardly draining the empire of manpower as Aeschylus imagined, could generate localized moments of social disruption and rearrangements of the economic status quo far from the scene of conflict. At the same time, the disaster that cut off some of Persia's most prominent aristocrats opened opportunities for others, such as Artabazos. Xerxes doubtless attempted to soften the impact on his royal image by depicting the campaign's outcome as the result of Mardonius's folly, a slander that made its way down to informants of Herodotus and the histories. Just as in another empire centuries later, where Quintilius Varus lost the emperor's legions, the ruler of the world could move on secure in his reign while a military embarrassment was charged to the account of a general who could never answer the charges against him. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That was that was really wonderful, um, and and a good in depth discussion of the bits and pieces of evidence. Uh, did he or did he not die? What can we use as secure evidence, and how do we read all of this? I I would invite the historians among us to to uh, raise their comments and questions. I I am overwhelmed uh, at the uncertainty of how we deal with a non dead Mardonius. No questions? Okay, you convinced us all. David. Thank you. I, this is actually a, a question um, sort of both for John and Christopher. I, I think there's a there's a thread in both of those talks that really kind of fascinated me. And that's um, a, a sort of an active possibility of a real strong dialogue between the Greek and Persian side as the memory of the war begins to evolve. I mean, a lot of the seals, uh, the, the images that Christopher was talking about are in the Western part of the empire. And John, you're, you're mentioning the, the very strong possibility, which I completely agree with, that some of those lines from Herodotus are at least dimly reflecting what appears to be a, a relatively legitimate, at least probable Persian narrative exculpating some of those defeats. And so I'm wondering if, if either or both of you would like to sort of comment on this I think a dynamic that hasn't been looked at a lot, right? I mean, I think there's been a lot of attention in the last few years thinking about various Greek states claiming parts of that war and attempting to spin it in their favor. But the idea that the Greeks in the 470s and 460s are not merely celebrating their victory, but trying to still win the memory game against a, a very close Persian empire that's still very much next door and is telling its potentially still loyal Greek city-states at Ionia that no, 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 <laughs> this was not a one-sided thing. Xerxes is still the, the best, and we didn't lose like that. And did you notice this seal about how we're killing this Greek? This thing is not over, right? I, I, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, David. I, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I, I point to, a, we have a number of episodes of direct dialogue between uh, Greeks and Persians that, that are happening in the immediate aftermath here. Um, and again, I think we, we need to remember David Lewis's uh, reminder that there's no iron curtain uh, here in, in the Aegean. Um, some, in relation to Mardonius's death, um, Herodotus tells us that the uh, reward is given by his son to uh, an, a man from Ephesus, um, from uh, one Dionysiphanes, who apparently made a convincing claim that he had buried Mardonius. For, for him to make that claim, he must have been with Mardonius uh, during the Plataea campaign. Um, he must have been there after the battle and presumably is taken prisoner by the, the Spartans, but then released uh, and goes back to Ephesus sometime in, uh, you know, we, we don't know the exact timing. Um, but then in 478, uh, the Greeks besieged the Greek polis of Byzantium uh, and its Persian garrison. 
um, Pausanias is successful. And what does he do? He ransoms back the Persian prisoners to the relatives. Uh, so again, we have direct dialogue and communication, you know, not even not only at the official level, but on individual Persians talking to individual uh, Greeks. Um, so I think there would have been many, many uh, potential avenues of, for this communication, uh, especially in Ionia and in, in the Propontic region. Now, Christopher, do you have anything yeah, to, to well, add? Um... Yes, I mean, there's no reason why what lies behind the eventual um, constructed narrative in Herodotus is not a, not a complicated history of, of kind of <laughs> recursive um, uh, use of, 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 of different perspectives on what, what had happened um, coming from the two sides and passing back and forth between them, I, this, this of course is perfectly possible. Um, I mean, right at the outset, I mean, John mentions the Borsanias ransoming, ransoming elite Persian prisoners, but I mean, the whole, the whole Borsanias story um, kind of encapsulates right at the outset of, of the post-war era, um, the notion of, potentially dangerous interaction between uh, people from the two sides, um, telling one another stories about what has happened or what is going to happen. Um, the trouble is that, that, I mean, that particular story is so encrusted with uh, scandal and, um, and, and, and party pre that one can't, can't really confidently figure out what the real events behind it might be, but they certainly, Precisely presuppose um, high-level contact between uh, between the two sides straight after, more or less straight after the war, um, and I guess this this went on. And it's certainly true that that I mean, as I said in my paper, you know, marathon wasn't the end of the matter. Well, actually, it necessarily at some level, from the Persian point of view, from the Persian point of view, Plataea couldn't couldn't be the end of the matter. I mean, couldn't actually, as it were ostentatiously concede, the question was exactly how ostentatiously one could deny and in what, what ways one could do that without simply producing the sort of fake news that, 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 that prompts contempt. Um, and again, as with the SEALs in particular, in general, the issue of audience matters here. And, and um, uh, I mean, arguing the toss, about what happened in Greece is, from a Persian point of view, important potentially in all sorts of parts of the empire. Um, but it certainly is important on the Greek fringe, uh, wherever, well, you know, either side of the Iron Curtain that doesn't exist. Um, you know, the, the Persians going to talk at a Greek audience and try and persuade them that, um, that things are not quite as clear as some other people might tell them. I mean, that's for sure. Look, I, I see we have a couple of hands up. It's Let's carry on with our discussion. I, I We're going to bite into our group discussion, but that's just fine. So Rol, uh, did you have something to contribute? <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, I'm really fascinated by the idea that, or the, the, the possibility that Mardonius didn't die, because I always like these sort of very radical <laughs> revisions where like Xerxes wasn't even there and Mardonius, well, you know, all these kinds of ideas which which i mean they cause sort of panic where you're just like okay but then what what is any of this true um i suppose one way to figure out what happened to mardonius is to see when the next time that the gobria die or whatever you want to call them when, when that when does that clan pop up again what's the next member of that family that has any kind of prominent role because they tend to you know that those who are close to the throne are quite small in number because that might actually maybe indicate something about what happened or how, how much longer Maronius was kicking about if he was? Right, this is, this is a really great point. And I, unfortunately, our, I mean, we, we run into the problem of evidence uh, in the mid fifth century uh, that you know, it's a giant problem for the Achaemenids and, and for the, the Greek world. Um, so you, there's the one reference in Herodotus to uh, Artantes, which is a, it's a, a version of the, the Persian name Artavant. Uh, which again is a fairly common 
Persian name. So that personal name shows up elsewhere, but but never with a patronymic that would suggest the connection. Um, in the account of the Battle of Eurymedon, interestingly, uh, the Plutarch in Life of Cimon uh, is citing earlier sources. I'm trying to remember which one. It, I think it might be his reference to Callisthenes. They, they mention one, but not all of the Greek accounts of Eurymedon claimed that the mm. Persian general there was, uh, I'm forgetting his first name, but he's described as a son of Gobrias. Right. But again, is that um, they don't make any explicit connection to Mardonius, and it's such a brief uh, passage. Would that then be a grandson of Mardonius or a brother? Oh. Right. That's. I mean, the other problem is that uh, Darius named one of his sons Gobrius uh, mm -hmm. after his father-in-law. Um, he he names one of his sons with one of Cyrus's daughters, Gobrius, and it seems to be again a way of honoring the family. Although we're preferring the offspring of the of Cyrus's daughters for you know the actual throne. Um, so I, the one other tantalizing thing is that um, I think I need to go back to this, but I think Catesius might refer to Mardonius as Mardonius the Elder. Um, I, I, I need to check the reference because it's been a, a while since I looked at that. Uh, but I feel like there was something there and then uh, Obviously, we have fragments, and so you know the, there was no clarification on what that would what that would mean. Um, but I think it's just an, we end up kind of hitting a dead end uh, with our references at a certain point. I mean, it's weird to think. Obviously, this is one of the seven. <laughs> How can this family just disappear? And yet, like the Fardabazos and his brethren are just kind of you know remain prominent for centuries, even after the fall of the Achaemenids. So it's just kind of weird to think that one of these families can just kind of go off stage? Well, the answer, of course, might be precisely that Mardonius failed at Plataea and, and that, that, whereas, you see, I mean, Herodotus makes this observation about Artabazus that, that, you know, he there were few who were more reputable than the king and he became even more logimos after the, the things at Plataea. Um, I mean, that is a kind of, almost a flag, you know, the result of Plataea, Mardonius and family, Artabazus, and, and Artabazus rise, I mean, that went on. It goes on through the fifth century, the end of, of, of that, the early fourth century, Farnabazus is, is marrying a, a royal daughter. I mean, that's a clan that really did um, do well out of what happened at Plataea. Um, but the Mardonius descendants or, 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 or other members of his family are not demonstrably discoverable later in, in any uh, prominent role, need not be surprising, I think, it, it provided one uh, is prepared to, to, to acknowledge that, um, that, that, that he was seen as, if you like, the scapegoat as defeat, but at any, at any rate, the person who was defeated and that has a bad effect on your family's reputation. Um, but, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I posited slightly whimsically in my paper that Xerxes um, might not have been entirely sure whether he was going to reallocate Mardonius' estate to his son. Mm. Um, it's a big inference to draw from, frankly, in a sense, no real evidence, but it's a perfectly reasonable thought experiment. Um, no, I, I accept that. Um, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just thinking now of, of John's chapter on Tissaphernes. That was your... Um, your thesis there was the idea that actually it is possible for kings to kind of forgive a failed general and then let him try again because he will be <laughs> encouraged by um, the need to salvage his reputation or is that right right sorry I think that's uh, Jeffrey Ropp's uh, chapter. Oh sorry yeah no that's correct yeah sorry. No. Um, I, I would just add uh, briefly on what Christopher said I, I think it's really tempting to uh, right I, I, I'm interested in that thought uh, about uh, you know, some possible repercussions for Mardonius's family. Um, but again, we, uh, we have so little evidence and we do have the reference to his son bestowing some generous rewards on, on yeah. multiple recipients. Um, so I wouldn't want to push it too mm. far. Uh, again, we also don't know who the satrap of Sardis is for the middle third or so of the, the fifth century. Mm. Uh, so we have big gaps in Achaemenid Anatolia uh, between the Herodotus period and the Thucydides period. Um, yeah. with, with our narratives. 